great pleasure to be here this morning to talk to you, Ian, about your artful life. For the purposes of introducing yourself to this audience, could you please tell us a little bit about where you came from and who you are? Uh, well, um, I'm Ian Smith, obviously. Uh, I came from Cairns. Uh, I've lived a lot of places around the world and now I live in Brisbane. I started painting when I was a schoolboy and by the time I was 30 I was lucky enough to be a full-time artist and I've been one ever since and I think somewhere in the middle there you realise the longer you stay out there the easier it becomes to stay out there. Even if it's the harder it gets <laughs> to paint, to be a painter as the older you get. And I've always done a lot of works and then I will sort of like reinvent myself, do something else. Mm. And I mean, when you look at other long living artists, say, well, like the obvious one, Picasso. If we hadn't all read about 100 books about Picasso, you would not associate his, say, Cubist works with the works he did in the 30s, much less the 50s, as being the same artist at all. And we only know it's all Picasso because we, we know it is. That's all him reinventing himself through the whole thing. And uh, not that I'm would dare to put myself up beside Picasso, but it's the same, same effect of reinvention when you live a long life as an artist. So Ian, you've always painted everyday situations and objects since you went to art school in the 70s. You really made a decision very early on to focus on not the necessarily the mundanity of everyday life, but the reality. In the early 70s, when I arrived at art school in Melbourne, um, although I, I knew a lot about abstract painting and modernism by then, uh, as a 20 year old who'd, who'd been reading about art all through school and painting a lot. Um, in a way, uh, contemporary painting, modernist painting had reached the point of uh, mythical and mystical uh, justification, and especially as paintings became more minimal, they thought that that was something more about the beyond, as well as it being about form and it is just what it is. Uh, so in other words, there were big uh, mythical subjects or, or mystical subjects tied up in abstraction. Whereas when you think about it around 1970, the contrary to that kind of uh, theoretical end of abstraction and minimalism, the contrary to that, the everyday life painting of that was, of course, pop art. Hmm. Now, even though Andy Warhol, the, the, one of the greatest exponents, was rapidly taking pop art into a Hollywood fantasy and religious mysticism, if you like. Um, the central issue of pop is, was to look at everyday things and see the, their artistic beauty, monumentality and so on. So without exactly painting uh, the same things as those guys, I, I did come back to a central mundane issue and started looking in my photo album, a snapshot sort of view of us, life. And when you think about it, that sort of run all the way through to now. But in the 70s, uh, when, when I went to art school in Melbourne, it wasn't the best about playing with art, doing something arty. There were very strong social and political issues as a backdrop. And while I didn't choose to paint issue paintings, you want to do paintings about something and it, it, it better be good, it better be worthwhile if you're going to bother doing art in this backdrop of all these important issues. If you want to play with art, it better be about something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And if, to a more finer point, if you want to be a figure of painter in that time, it had better be good mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. the figure of art was out, 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 out. And so I sort of like I said, supported by the, 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 the best of pop artists, I came down to a, to a personalised but deadpan, normal, mundane subject matter and took it from there. And also to keep my head above water in the Melbourne setup, uh, there was incredible pressure to conform with groups within all the new liberalism. It's a bit like Oh, I'm wearing jeans so I don't conform, but everyone was wearing jeans, but, and philosophically that would happen too. And there was a big pressure to do certain types of painting and, and to be a figurative painter, it had better be good. The art had to <coughs> make a strong proposal and fulfil it. Also though, to keep my head above water in the uh, 
Melbourne milieu, uh, I decided that I'd go all the way and going to be, be doggedly do something about having come from North Queensland. Mind you, it was a funny hippie time when people were saying, hey man, what are you doing down here? We all want to drop out to Kuranda, man. You know? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I've done that. I'm down here now, you know. Like. And, uh, but I did, I read a lot of uh, Deep South literature, American Deep South literature. I used deliberately um, North Queensland motels, fibro house settings, uh, uh, people wearing funny coloured clothes, bad dress combinations, leaned on green, green hotted up Monaro's with racing stripes and things like that. That was the thing. Of course, that sounds like everyone's done art like that now. But when you think back on it, this was 1970, and mm, I'm not saying mm. I was the first one to look at that stuff, but it was um, almost like you were having a dangerous flirtation with kitsch to find a real Australian imagery that was relevant to go ahead within the times. And that's what I meant about doing art. And that's the stuff I worked out in art school. And um, in fact, that is why it's because I took that kind of road that interested people like Ray Hughes and showing me almost like from them when I was still in art school. And even though your work was clearly making its own direction at odds with the prevailing fashions, you had a lot of early success. I mean, you did have that early show with Ray in Brisbane when you were still at art school. Yes. You ended up working as a lecturer in your early 20s um, at Queensland College of Art. So you really capitalised on the individual um, aesthetic that you had created from a very early age. Well, I think once I got to college, I wanted to promote that attitude in my students, which I, I thought was the right attitude. Mm. But nevertheless, like the Art School of Melbourne also did have a good, serious intellectual discussive base because people, your art couldn't just be decorative. Mm whatever form it took. And we all agreed on that. Like I said, we had against this socially political backdrop, the art had to be about something. And if mine was about looking at the essence of normal life as a powerful thing, um, in which a lot of answers lay about existence. You know, step by step, picture by picture, you'll build, you couldn't do it all in one picture, but picture by picture, you built up an attitude and thing. So, um, my first job out of college, I, um, I worked at Channel 9, paint sets, paint, used to paint Graham Kennedy's barrel and paint the <laughs> sets for, and I did a lot of work in that big round studio that everyone would know now from Hey Hey at Saturday night. Then I was offered a job up in Brisbane and I was happy to get out of Melbourne at that point, just like for personal reasons. And, um, and I thought I'd come up here for maybe a couple of years and go to Sydney or something. You know. Anyway, because when I got here, I'd already had this association with Ray Ray thought it was great. He had, he had his new mate up in town who, who was his plant in the art school. And within two years of me coming here, Ray and others had started the IMA and I was one of the first sort of like members. And uh, so I stayed here. And mm. all through that period though, I still held out as a figurative painter against the backdrop of um, well, a lot of installation and, and um, performance works. Mm. But when you think about it in those times, see, the rigour of that position then made me start doing these pictures of, like, they were paintings, but they were a bit like conceptual art. And the classic early one being uh, my Paint a Painting series, which I started, where, and I was doing diptychs, where I wanted to do paintings that weren't as balanced, if you like, as triptychs were. Right. And as much as I, a mm. triptych is balanced, even though mm. a diptych is too, it has a sort of unbalance. Mm. And so I enforced my work on that and then I made the two sides quite different. So he had a figurative image on one side and a um, messy sort of abstract material side on the other side. So it was painter, painting. Probably express my uh, young frustration, if not defiance, against should I be a figurative painter or should I be an abstract painter? And those paintings, they were done, if, if you like, uh, while while I'm sort of enjoying being having quite a lot of uh, philosophic clout, and I'm the new young guy at the art school. 
and that's why they almost like moved me from first year painting very rapidly on the third year. They realised I was a guy that had some grasp of what was going on in real contemporary art. Mm. But my own paintings had to have this conceptual edge for me to justifiably do them against the 70s backdrop of performance, installation, cool minimalism, uh, text, works, all mm. that stuff. And um, no, I'm glad I stayed painting. Mm. The duality in those works that you kind of brought into focus in that period reflects in some ways this kind of um, two sides of the coin that you've continued with throughout. And um, there was a 1977 painting you called Man Who Drove North All Morning and South All Afternoon. It's, it's the two sides of a coin. And then when I look at your life, there's the split canvases and then there's art and architecture. Double bending figures. Yes, figure, landscape, animal, human, landscape, cityscape, physical, cerebral, um, life, death, painterly, pop. So I guess it feels like um, that's something that's really become a big reflect, even the billboard paintings that we see yeah, yeah, all nature, around us here. Nature, man made thing. Yes, yeah. But when you think about it, that was an extension of my, uh, it occurred to me that, that duality was like a similarly mundane thing. Like it was everywhere. Everyone experienced it. And, but what did it, mit, what did, what was the bigger meaning of that? So you had man, woman, night, day, uh, so on. And so ironically I'd stumble on through my own confusion about figurative painting or non-figurative painting. I'd invented a, a good format which linked with what I wanted to do with mundane figurative imagery mm. but approached a bigger idea in life mm. of duality mm. yes good and evil you know the big yes. questions you know like yes um, and um, it, it and it was a, a format that gave a kind of concept, conceptual appearance to my silly old figurative paintings in the 70s mm. it's also possible to see the way you've traveled in your life so from Cairns where you grew up to Melbourne to art school. Um, in the 80s you lived between Brisbane and Belgium um, and even currently there's the Brisbane Lamb Island connection. So perhaps we should talk about um, you know here you are in the 70s pretty successful painter. Um, I think you went off on a fairly, fairly seminal trip to the States at which point, even at the fairly late age, when you had all that success in your late 20s, you really recommitted to being a painter. Yeah. And of course, I eventually would be vindicated with that by, by the 80s. But all those blokes who were painting squares in the 70s who were not even painting ran out of doors, realised all the attention had swung around on a German and <laughs> Italian new figure of painters. But before we get to that, this uh, trip to America, you mentioned. Mm. It was very pivotal in what happened next in the sense that I saw a lot of art museums, there was a lot of thinking, met a lot of people out of the context of here, saw if you like the new, the big world and a lot of my contemporary art heroes and the big paintings, their big work and I saw the real stuff and I sort of uh, 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 arrogantly said well if there's going to be full-time artists in this world, I want to be one of them. And within a year, I did quit my job at the art school, went out there and still out there. Mm. So when you think about it, I got to the 80s with the experience of a good grounding in an intellectual-based art school. I was running around with Ray Hughes all through the 70s and like Ray was really forming himself and what he was up to in that mm. time. We were sort of working out together had this sort of mind-blowing um, uh, uh, affirming trip to the States and then I quit my job so by the 80s I was pretty well foolishly or not ready to take on being a full-time artist in the 80s. I did have a few commissions to start on as I went into the 80s which maybe gave me the, the very uh, immediate courage to do it. So at first I didn't have any uh, mouths to feed except my own Mm. And then by the time I was uh, 35, I, I, I had a stable relationship and, a, and, a, and my son was born in 1984. 
So, but I, I made money. We made money. The mm. 80s made money. And by 1984, you had a show in New York, which must have felt like um, you'd arrived in some sense. Yeah, well, Ray very much set that up because he's over there for uh, another show that he had some artists in that was a show, that's sort of world survey that we're doing at the uh, Museum of Modern Art. But Ray rang me up and said, did I want to do a show in New York? I said, yeah, sure. And so we did. And while we were away, I sold like several ponies, won a prize at the Gold Coast back here. And we got this all over the telephone in New York. And it was all just like, that's mm. how it was supposed to be. And mm. we do the show in New York. And one of the paintings there, that went into the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mm. When they were in the process of acquiring it, a letter they sent me said they wanted the painting because it showed that whilst Smith or you uh, exhibit a, a, a strong knowledge of um, international modernism, there's strong regional content in the work. Mm. And that's why we find it interesting. And that was a change that, in a way, vindicated the stance I suppose I'd taken earlier. It was one of those paintings of bending figures where I'd sort of got on this thing, at, like that glib thing oh, I first started, like I'd done figures standing up, I'd seen done figures looking down on top of them, I'd done figures where only the leg was sticking up out of a, a swimming pool, or I'd done uh, all these paintings of people on the decks of ships where you saw all chopped up bits but presumed the rest of the body was there somewhere. And then I got into this bending figure format which my glib joke at the time was if you bend them over they fit in the picture better <laughs> and the feet don't go out the bottom of the picture when you get down to the feet. If you start from the head it's always mm. the head's too big and by the time you get down. You see it all the time in the Archibald, all these people chopped off somewhere below the knees. Mm. And um, if that, there is a painting, one of my paintings of Ray Hughes that went into the Archibald. I did lose him out the bottom, but I made another stretcher, a foot eye, and put it on so I got his shoes in. <laughs> you, know, you know, with Ray, you, you couldn't paint the bow tie, the pink shirt, the, the green jacket, and, the, and the, the moleskin pants and not show what sort of shoes he was wearing. Mm, mm. But I would add bits on. But I did start on that thing of, it was just another thing, and I thought, that's pretty interesting figure format. And this is, you know, coming back, this is, it was one of these paintings that is in the Metropolitan. Mm, mm. And it's funny how things come around without planning, you know, like I just did a bending figure painting and it seemed to make so much sense to me that I ended up doing a whole, well, I think I painted them for the next year. That was the mm, prevailing mm. image I used. But that bending figure thing gave me a base image, almost like a emblematic thing. Mm. Then off you went to Europe for a few years. And um, what do you think Europe added to your lexicon of um, images and ideas and your practice as an artist? Uh, well, first let me say, like, when we went there, we went there to live there. We, we packed up the house, rented a house out in France, and basically it was on a year-by-year -year assessment thing. And I ended up having a show in Australia every year for the eight years I lived there. Mm. Uh, Nora never came back on her return ticket. But I had a great time there and basically, to cut the long story short, what the, the paintings I ended up doing, I'd been doing a lot of paintings of cane toads as a, in 1988, 87, 88, leading up to the, well it was the bicentennial of, of uh, white culture's arrival or invasion, had titles like long-term immigrant, short-term emigrant where I, there would be a picture of a businessman walking off into the sea with his briefcase on one side and a big cane toad huddled on the other side. And I saw the cane toad as a sort of fairly interesting metaphor for the long-term immigrant, which was us, uh, with all the good and bad that came of it. And so when I got to Europe, I was still sort of doing toads in my head. And instead of it being then suddenly the toad was the immigrant into Australia, I saw myself as the cane toad in Europe. So that was what I painted in Europe when I first got there and, and variations thereof. But it was always about, see I'd never become a, a European painter, I was too old when I went there. When you're 38 you've already got in a way an Australian career behind you. You're always going to be, oh that Australian artist that lives there. So mm. in a way that became the subject of my work. But slowly I'd worked out, just like any other deep life decisions in art about 
like going against the grain that in the 1970 doing figurative painting in the face of other what was I was supposed to be doing it was the realization that it was right for me to come back here and of course I left uh, my family and kids and my kids I still get on great with they now they're like my son's 30 this year and my daughter's 27 they understand perfectly why I did that and they mm. don't hate me for it mm. Some of those um, images in an aircraft of your kids coming backwards and yeah. forwards really felt like a very um, strongly drawn memoir. There was yeah. a, there's a lot of emotion in um, the, the distance that you were dealing one, with. Once again, they were painted probably ten years after the mm. experience they were about, mm. um, just to to fill it in. Yeah, what the first one was called, "Man with His Children on an International Flight." The inference being. There was a man was with. Yes. There's been uh, worlds full of mother and child paintings, uh, but in the times which we live, uh, the father and the kids has become a, a new uh, demographic molecule, hasn't it? That of course was talking about me when some of my trips around the world I did have my kids with me, and it was a deliberately emotional issue, which then led to me I had to do the one man without his kids, mm, mm. and that one the other two seats looked like empty nests, not because the kids are left home, like that expression, but because the man took taking the flight without them. Mm. So you made the decision to come back and live in Australia from 94, um, and then you began this process, organically or not, of reconnecting with Australia through the driving that you were doing, and that kicked off the next series of works, I believe. Uh, yeah, um, because um, the, um, the cliché that he came back from being away a long time and saw his home place with new eyes, it's a cliché because it's true. And naturally that did lead me to do certainly land, landscape settings of idea paintings, not, not exactly full on landscapes, but and probably the culmination of those works uh, were about stuff well it like I'm not I've never been an artist and I never will who goes out in the middle of nowhere and does a landscape if even if I do a landscape painting it's usually got some presence of man uh, mm. man's activities in it a winding track a fence a water hole with stagnant water in it with green moss on it something like that and um, that did lead me on to doing these uh, so-called billboard paintings. I didn't want to paint billboards with the message side. There was enough people doing that. A lot of photographers have taken photos of, you know, uh, totally absurd, out of place billboard messages in the landscape. You know, mm. uh, you know about soft drink in the desert behind it, sort of thing. Uh, but I was always noting the um, the backs of billboards and. I started though to see these backs of billboards and the blank fronts as sort of like, uh, well like I said, holes in the landscape. Because the billboard wasn't advertising something to you, you were supposed not to notice that it was there. And yet, it was very real presence. And beyond that, it, the Frost Smith, the frustrated abstract painter, I could, if I painted the back of the billboard, I could do wonders with every sort of grid and thing fixed up with wire and all sorts of rust marks and everything on, and I could do all these uh, pseudo paintings of my favourite abstract painters mm. but it was still a real thing of the back of a billboard standing in the landscape so that was a real, so all those once again a bit like the bending figures I did one and then suddenly all these meanings but painting possibilities abounded once you got rolling with it and then you couldn't do enough mm. So we're sitting in your studio in Dutton Park um, in inner Brisbane and we're surrounded by certainly the remnants of a 40 year career and what's immediately surrounding us includes some of the work that's come back from your most recent institutional show at um, Redland Art Gallery in Cleveland, Bay Pastels City Paintings. So um, I guess it's a good point to talk about where you're at now, um, where you think the work's going to take you next. Um, yeah, well, when I look around my studio, I mean, when the 50 works for that show came out of here, it didn't look any different. No. It's still stacked full. 
seven and eight. And now that they've all arrived back, they're rather sitting around waiting for me to work out where to put them back, which slots to put them back into. But the point is it suddenly makes my studio look, look like a, uh, the stock room of a serious art gallery rather than a working studio. But apart from the fact that I work in other spaces here in my place, which extends into the garden, and I do a lot of painting outdoors, and, uh, but I'm at a point where I wasn't really doing so much painting because I'm rethinking the whole thing. It's almost like maybe the show I've had at Redlands has given me an opportunity to reflect on what I'm doing next. You know, I'm 64 this month, and I think I'm really at the point where having done a lot of subject, like not only figure of art, but a lot of subject matter art, I'm back to the point where I'm coming back to the essence of, essences like man, woman, food, drink, and in our society, car, house, um, and then as an artist, art, somehow I link art up with sex, and all these things, not necessarily in this order by the way, so mm. like man's not at the top, it's just, mm. that's the starting point. I'm a man. But and then you have like I suppose technology, nature, sport, religion. Or are they both the same thing? I'm not sure. <laughs> In Australia possibly they um, are, yes. <laughs> uh, faith, um, oblivion, you know. Those sort of issues. And so I think I'm coming back to the next lot of paintings. I've just been fiddling around with a lot of little portraits these days which are over there and of different people I see and self portrait people see around so just so in a way I'm, I think the next lot of paintings will be rather simple straightforward paintings about very unsimple unstraightforward things.